Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show, HJ hey, Picks. The other half of the show, the Parlay. Joining me in to break down some UFC Vegas 75. Let's get it. <laughs> We got 14 fights. We're back at the Apex in Las Vegas, headlined by Marvin Vittori and Jared Cannonier. Initial thoughts, what are you thinking? Oh, you know, finally a, a card that we haven't had any fights drop off of yet. Uh, 14 fights is a lot for a fight night, at least in my recent memory. I can't remember having a fight, like us getting to fight night with 14 um, fights to look forward to. So it's kind of nice, especially coming off of a pay-per-view with only 11. So I'm pretty pumped for it. There's some good matchups on this card. Yeah, pretty unbelievable to you know go from eleven fights on a card, a pay per view card in Canada that like they haven't had an event there in so long, and then you get fourteen fights in the Apex a week later. Doesn't really make sense, but <laughs> I mean we'll take it uh, as far as the viewers that are going to be watching on TV and uh, just excited to have fights. You know we got a, a lot of fights coming up every weekend. There's also some Bellator this weekend, some PFL, so jam packed weekend. Uh, the summer is only looking up, but this card, some decent matchups on here. Not a lot of like big name value, but you're looking at, you know, some up and comers, some older fighters who, you know, may be fighting for a spot um, and should be some good fights overall. I, I think uh, it could could be one of those apex cards where, you know, there's a lot of unexpected fights that turn out to be fun. So, right. I agree. We will start it off, though, with. The main event, Marvin Vittori coming in at minus 135 against Jared Cannonier, plus 135. The middleweight main event, three and two in their last five for both men. 29 years of age for Marvin Vittori, 39 years of age for Jared Cannonier. So he's getting up there. He's been around for a while. Obviously started his career at heavyweight, came down to light heavyweight, and now he's a shredded 185. And uh, Marvin Vittori... Coming off the win to Roma Delice, Jared Cannonier coming off the win over Sean Strickland. Both of those had some bit of uh, controversy as far as who won or who, or who didn't. Close fights. I think uh, both of them probably could have went either way. Uh, I did think the 30-27 uh, with Marvin Vittori versus Delice was a little generous. I thought <laughs> Delice won that first round for sure. Uh, but then I think the last two rounds in that fight was was for Vittori, um, but nonetheless, a close fight, and he's getting you know, a step up here against Jared Cannonier, who has been tested against Israel Adesanya, as had has uh, Vittori twice, and both guys within the past five years have only lost to Israel Adesanya and Robert Whitaker. So two guys that are maybe the gatekeeper after Robert Whitaker, these two guys, you could make the comparisons, um, the gatekeeper to Robert Whitaker. Uh, Duplessis didn't have to go through him though, but what are you thinking on this one? Yeah, interesting. We were talking right before this that both of these guys only losses in the last five years, Izzy and Robert Whitaker. I mean, that's not too bad, and they're both beating some some decent competition. Vittori obviously beating Delize, and um, call it what you want, you know, close fight. And uh, other than that, Paulo Costa, Kevin Holland, Jack Hermanson, like all bigger named guys in the division. But I just wish Marvin Vittori had that finishing ability because if he did, the guy could be unstoppable. I mean, he's damn near impossible to finish, to knock out. He's got a granite chin. He's got great volume and usually can fight, you know, all three rounds. Um, but, man, it's just like his punches just don't have a lot of sting on him. Like, he might hurt his opponents a little bit, but he, he lacks that big, big shot to really put guys out. And uh, if he had it, man, I feel like he, you know, against Roman Delize, it probably would have been – he probably could have finished Roman as Roman got tired there. And the uh, same could be said for a lot of his fights. Jared Cannonier, obviously the big power puncher, but it kind of evens itself out with, you know, Vittori not being able to be put out. So oh. um, for Cannonier, I hate, I hate that uh, if he's not going to be able to get the knockout, I don't know if he has the volume to keep up a good pace against Vittori for all three rounds here. Like if, if you're not going to finish Vittori, you better have a ton of volume and look better to the judges. And Vittori's, you know, a master of of just hitting you more times than you can get him. And 
can't crack the chin, you're not going to, you're not going to beat Vittori by sitting back and relying on those one big punches every now and then. So right now I'm leaning Vittori. Uh, I think it is a good matchup. Both guys have fought at the top of the division for a while now. Um, it's kind of a toss up to me, but I just got to rely on the, the endurance and obviously the chin and, and the volume as well. So I think Vittori can edge this thing out. You know, it's crazy. I was looking through, uh, like what happened today in, in UFC history when I was doing my videos today. And, uh, what was it three years ago today? Marvin Vittori got a finish by submission. That Ooh is only finished within the past seven years. So I was like, dang, that's uh, what a day, you know, 2020, <laughs> June 13th, Marvin Vittori submits Carl Roberson by rear naked choke in the first round. And that's his only finish in the last seven years. So yeah, the, uh, the volume on the feet is there. It's just like the punching power, I guess just isn't there. The dude is, is a, a brick wall because you obviously can't knock him out. He's never been knocked out. Uh, has he been knocked down? I don't think he's been knocked down either. Um, but I'm looking at this one against Jared Cannonier. I'm like five rounds. Vittori's got, you know, cardio for days. He can go forever. He can take shots forever. Uh, I got to lean his way because he's also the younger fighter too. Like Jared Cannonier pushing 40 years old at this point, he got his title shot uh, against Izzy and, you know, at, at this age, it's like, well, how many fights does he have left to get back to that title shot? And does anyone even want to see that fight again? You know, yeah. so at least for Vittori, there's something there to like work towards. You know, like what's the what's the ob objection for for Cannoneer? And uh, I honestly think a Vittori and Strickland are like kind of similar fighters in the way that they're going to stand in front of you and they're, you know, they're going to swing with you. They're not really going to. Try to take you down. Vittori will go there sometimes, um, but for the most part, I mean, he's pretty light on his feet, southpaw, and he's just going to try to outwork you on the feet. Uh, if he does go for the takedowns in this one, it it's, could be a path to victory for him. I mean, he does average 1.77 uh, per 15 minutes. Jared Cannonier, 64% takedown defense and uh, got taken down by Brunson three times. So there's a there's another another spot that Vittori could take it, but I just got to go with the younger fighter. And that's my guy because everyone says that I look like him. So I, I'm going to go with Marvin Vittori against Jerry Cannonier in this one. Um, but I think it's probably pretty properly priced, but personally, I'm just going to go with the younger fighter, more activity and maybe a little bit more to fight for. So, yep. You, you talked about Marvin Vittori never being knocked down in the UFC, which is correct. But in 14 fights, he only has one knockdown offensively, <laughs> and that's the Jack Hermanson. In a fight, to his credit, he landed 164 strikes, which is insane in a three-round fight for, for those big boys up there. So, um, yeah, and it's another one of those things, too. If you're looking at the props, like for no house advantage or, or prize picks or something, how do you even go about taking Vittori's strikes over unders? Because some of these fights, man, against the Leeds, he lands 106. Um, against Robert Whitaker in three rounds, he lands 33. <laughs> he lands 190 against Paulo Costa, which was a five round fight, but still, um, you know, and, and on down the list, then 58 against Izzy 24 against Kevin Holland in a five round fight, but he had 11 takedowns. So it's like, and then 164 against Hermanson. So he's kind of tough to gauge. Like he's got a, a few, yeah. two different styles, really stand and trade with you outpoint you or fight guys like Kevin Holland and take you down 11 times. and. Um, just make a boring ass fight and and probably get the win on the on the judges scorecards. So, yeah, he's yeah. an interesting cat to watch. He is, and it, I just find it so crazy that he's like that thick of a dude that he he has one knockdown in his entire UFC career. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. But the guy must have an iron head. So yeah, we will see. I'll go with Vittori though. The co-main event: a lightweight bout between Armand Sarukian coming in at minus eight hundred against Joaquim Silva, who's coming in at plus 800, over under one and a half rounds, plus 135 for the over, minus 135 for the under. Odds are presented by Bet Openly, as always. I think I forgot to say that, but you're going to have 1% juice there. There's no house, so that's why these odds are uh, damn near, you know, even on one side and uh, negative on the other side at the same, at same price, so. 
keep that in mind. Four and one in the last five for Armin Saruki and his only losses to Mateusz Gamrat uh, of those last five. And uh, he was supposed to be fighting Moicano, I believe. Moicano had to, to pull out of their main event fight, so they rescheduled him against Joaquim Silva here in a co-main event spot. Um, and obviously the odds would ind indicate he's supposed to roll over him, but are you giving Joaquim Silva any kind of chance in this one? <clears throat> I don't think I can, and um, for a couple reasons. Sarukian has you know been fighting at such a high level lately uh, you know fighting guys I, I know the gamrot fight like i i thought he won that fight and if he would have won that fight he would have beat everybody in the ufc besides islam makachev that he's fought so far uh, yeah. which is impressive because he might not be fight, fighting the highest level of guys so far but every fight he is kind of going to step up you know beats demir ismagulov in his last fight who was like had an insane record what was it, like 20 something and one going into that fight one loss. Um, one loss in his in his record on his record. So, um, and he took him down seven times in that fight, which which is impressive. Sarukian, his wrestling is super high level. He's super strong, and he does it the the whole duration of the fight. He even took Islam Makachev down, which is impressive in itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're Silva, you kind of just got to come out swinging, in my opinion, because you're not gonna go a full three rounds and beat Armin Sarukian, you know, by by points in this one, especially, you know, short notice. And uh, if you look at, at Sarukian, he's got some power in his hands. He grapples a lot, but he also, um, you know, he, he's got a couple KOs on his record against Joel, Joel Alvarez and Christos. Gia yeah, I almost called him Giagos. <laughs> Giagos. Um, so he does have the power, man. And, and Silva, his last two losses are by knockout to Ricky Glenn and Nazrat Haparast. So, yeah, man, I don't know. I'm going to be interested to see what that knockout prop for Armin is. Um, there's a couple of paths to victory for him. You, you could take him down, you could try to submit him or, or win a decision or catch him on the feet because the guy's uh, obviously been chinned lately in his last two losses. So I, I just don't see him going out there and really posing too much of a threat to Armin Sarukian. Sarukian's tough. Um, you're not going to take him down and control him. And uh, he's probably going to hold the power advantage too. So it should be interesting though to, to see how quick he can do it. Yeah, I mean, Joaquim Silva's got a number of knockouts on his record, but I would find it pretty hard to, to think that he pulls this one off because I think Sarukian's probably like, he's like the next Islam Makachev. Like people don't want to fight this guy because he's so damn like skilled everywhere the fight goes. He, he's got some solid hands. And then obviously the, the wrestling and the grappling is just you know on another level. Nobody wants to fight this guy because yeah. he's not you know highly ranked. You know, if you lose to him, he, like that doesn't really help you at all. Uh, and if you beat him, it doesn't really help you at all. Uh, because look at Matosh Gamrot. He he beat him, and then they give him Benil Daryush, and uh, you know, he lost to Benil Daryush. I mean, I, I think Sarukian would have beat Benil Daryush. Looking at it like this, like I think Sarukian could give Islam like one of the hardest fights because we already saw it, and that was his debut. So I mean, we're looking at this one like. Is uh can Joaquim Silva really pull this off? I'm not giving him a chance. I'm not gonna not gonna lie. Because even Sarukian's fights in the UFC, like he's taken down for Vola 10 times. He took uh demolished Christos Yagos, demolished Joel Alvarez, like jo just completely smashed his face in, like got him to the ground and was raining elbows on the guy's face and uh just ground and pound TKO'd him. And then to do that to Demir Izmogulov, who's, like you said, had one loss, 30-27 to him, like, easy money to him. Like, straight up. That was that was crazy. And uh, I can see why nobody wants to fight him because it's not going to be a, a fun fight for anybody. Like, that's not uh, a knock-em-out, drag-em-out type fight where you get, like, some kind of moral victory if you lose. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're, gonna, you're in for a long night. You're going to get taken down. And you're gonna be, you know, put through the ringer for three rounds if you last that that long. Um, and it is a co-main event, so luckily for Joaquim Silva, it's not gonna go more than three rounds. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna get take Sarukian, and uh, I like the KO prop too. I think he'll probably do it, um, whether it's ground and pound or he catches him on the feet. Yeah, and Sarukian, man, he's just the last thing I'll say. 
that I noticed watching film on him is in the grappling and wrestling. Like the guy uses his his balance so well, like his weight distribution. Like he's so good at making you think like you're safe up against the cage, and then you move one way, he's just gonna ride you into the ground, and over and over and over, to where he just breaks guys. Like I hope he climbs the ranks and keeps winning, and we can see that Islam matchup because at 155 right now, I think he matches up better than anybody. Yeah, it's, I don't even know who who would fight him next. Like nobody wants to fight this guy. It doesn't make sense for anybody to fight him. You know, right? I guess maybe Benil because like he's coming off a loss that he's got like the grappling. Um, you know, that might be his next matchup, honestly. Maybe, maybe Benil could, you know, get back into the mix too with a win over a guy like that. So, yeah, that's yeah, crazy. Uh, middleweight bout here, Armin Petrosian. So, two Armins on this card. Armin Petrosian coming in at plus 130 against Christian Leroy Duncan coming in at minus 130, over under two and a half rounds, minus 115 for the over, plus 115 for the under. The undefeated Christian Leroy Duncan coming in here. After getting a uh, TKO win in his debut, which was actually an injury by Dusko Todorovic, he blew his knee out in the first round. And uh, Petrosian coming in here, he was on the UFC 280 card against AJ Dobson and got uh, pretty much a, a 30 27 win there, just kind of out kickboxed him. Um, and he's coming in here, I mean, probably fighting another body type like an AJ Dobson. In Christian Leroy Duncan, who's an athletic, uh, he's going to use his movement pretty well. Uh, flying knees, you know, jumping attacks, just explosive movements, quick hands. Uh, and Petrosian, a very, very solid kickboxer as far as, you know, points, point fighting goes. He's got some good KO power as well. So it's probably going to be a stand-up battle. Neither guy has ever shot a takedown, and uh, I don't expect them to in this one. So it's a stand-up battle. Petrosian sitting at plus 130 against the, I would honestly call it somewhat of a debut for Christian Leroy Duncan because he didn't really get to fight too much against Dusko. And I got to say, I'm kind of leaning Petrosian because Leroy's coming in here. That first fight was in London. And this time he's going to have to fly all the way to Vegas because he, he trains in the UK, I believe. Uh, you know, big longtime Cage Warriors fighter. So he's going to have to fly all the way to Vegas, and then he's going to fight in front of no crowd. Like It might be a little bit of a different feeling for him. So I'm going to go with Petrosian in this one uh, because of all those factors, and I think he's just a little bit more seasoned as far as MMA and combat sports go. I know Christian Leroy Duncan's been an uh, athlete for a while. Um, so I'm going to go. What do you think? Yeah, I'm actually on the same side as you for a couple of reasons. Like, I've watched all of Armin's fights, like dating back to the contender series when he got the big knockout, like and on the feet, he's really slick. And, you know, you look at him out there, he almost looks like, um, I mean, not exactly style wise, but he looks like Benil Dariush out there. Like he's not this huge jack dude or, you know, throwing these crazy shots or anything, but he's super technical at times. He lands six significant strikes per minute, which is really high. And he only gets hit with 2.75. With a 58% striking defense. So it's kind of hard to hit him. He's kind of elusive on the feet and he can rack the volume up too. If the fight plays out on the feet over a duration of three rounds, I mean, against AJ Dobson, 118 strikes landed against Robocop, Gregory Rodriguez, 127 strikes landed to uh, Robocop 61. And he even got taken down twice in that fight. So he showed he can get back to his feet. The only time he really struggles is against grapplers. Like, yep. You know, even on the contender series fight, he was taken down a handful of times and ended up finding that knockout. And uh, against Kyle Barallo, you know, he got taken down four times and lost that, um, uh, yeah, by unanimous decision. But in that fight, I mean, Kyle didn't really do anything. He landed 12 strikes. I mean, that's it, 12 strikes to Armin's 31. And like I said, just got taken down four times. But I don't see him having that problem here with Christian Leroy Duncan. Um, and for Duncan, man, uh, he's had some great knockouts, some great wins, you know, in Cage Warriors. But at the same time, like some of the guys he's beating aren't exactly UFC caliber or UFC level. So it's almost like for me, I haven't seen enough of him in a promotion like the UFC to be confident to lay my money against a guy like Armin, who's going to want this fight on the feet and who has showed he has the volume. He's hard to hit and he's got some power, too. So 
Um, yeah, if you're going to give me dog money on the guy with more UFC experience, guys who are fighting, you know, he hasn't exactly had a uh, Armin hasn't exactly had an easy road in his first three UFC fights. Gregory Rodriguez, Kyle Barallo, and AJ Dobson, who's probably is you know the lesser opponent of the other two. So, yeah, man, I think I think this is a good fight either way. But I do see Armin having a slight advantage on the feet, unless Christian Leroy Duncan is just the truth, and we just don't know it yet. Yeah, I just look at it this like he's. Everybody wants to take him down when they get in there with him. Like all of the opponents have gotten him down uh, a couple times. And the only one that beat him because they got him down was Kyle Barrio, who's like a, a stud on the ground. Like once he gets you to the ground, like you're, you're pretty much done. You're going to yeah. be there. Uh, I don't see Christian Lee or I Duncan pulling that off in this one. Um, so I guess unless he, he KOs Petrosian, I just think he's going to outwork him and, and probably win a decision. Uh, if it, if it makes it there, probably will. <clears throat> Featherweight bout here, Pat Sabatini coming in at minus 165 against Lucas Almeida, coming in at plus 165. Over under two and a half rounds, plus 125 for the over, minus 125 for the under. Lucas Almeida, four and one in his last five, 14 and one in his pro career. Pat Sabatini, four and one in his last five as well. And uh, his last fight out, he got kicked in the in the face by Damon Jackson I believe or yep. a knee in the face it was some kind of flying uh object at his face and uh kind of a, a letdown there for him cuz he was he was the favorite in that one minus 200 um and Damon Jackson I believe had like a pretty heavy heart going into that one uh but he's coming in here as the favorite again against Lucas Almeida who is in a, a Really exciting fight against Mike Trezano in his debut, and he was the underdog there, came through with the third-round knockout. So uh, I got to say, I mean, on the feet, I think Lucas Almeida is probably going to be looking pretty sharp against Pat Sabatini. The only thing is uh, the takedowns. If, is, can he stuff the takedowns against Pat Sabatini? And uh, that's a tall task because he lands 3.75 per 15 minutes, and he's a... Uh, a little bit of a he's a grinder he, he's a grinder when when he gets you to the ground he's got good submission skills submitted jamal emmers with that uh heel hook but then i also look at who he's beaten in the ufc and it doesn't look like that impressive when you look back at it like tj laramie by decision tucker lutz by decision tristan Connolly by decision and then jamal emmers by that heel hook and then loses to damon jackson so i mean four wins that are Jamal Emmer's submission is looks pretty good now. Uh, but the other three are like, how much can you, how much stock can you put in them? Um, so what are you thinking on this one? Yeah, it's interesting. It's obviously, you know, grappler versus mainly striker, a guy with a lot of knockouts and, and yeah. power. If it stays on the feet, it's obviously Almeida's fight. If it goes to the ground, it's going to be dicey because Sabatini is really good and, and he's good with his control. I mean, but if you look at it, man, I know a lot of people rave about his submission game and uh, his jujitsu, but in the UFC, he's got three decision wins and one sub over Jamal Emmers. So um, he's not going out there and subbing all of his opponents in his wins by any means. And uh, Lucas Almeida, I don't think he's a slouch on the ground. He hasn't really shown, um, I guess, the, the urgency to get the fights to the ground and look for submissions, but the guy's got 13 finishes out of his 14 wins, nine by knockout, four by submission. So he at least knows what he's doing. Um, if Sabatini wins, I think it's, you know, obviously decision or submission. But if Almeida wins, I got a funny feeling it's going to be something crazy. Flying knee, you know, knee as Pat Sabatini shoots in for a takedown, some kind of knockout. Because I like Almeida. I took him in his last fight against Trezano by KO. And I'll never forget it because I was, you know, kind of getting – ran off TikTok for picking him in that fight um, and picking him by KO, but he came through. Uh, I'm a fan of him. I, I like his style. He's one of those fighters that's going to fight till the very end. He's always looking to finish you, whether it is, you know, a big knockout or some kind of submission. Um, and those kind of guys are hard not to, you know, take a chance on. Yeah. I'll probably play this fight a few different ways. Um, for my pick, I, I don't know how I can get off the Lucas Almeida train. I don't know how. I mean, Sabatini coming off that loss to Damon Jackson. Like, where's his head at? That was, you know, pretty bad. He was a big favorite in that fight, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, man, give me Almeida. I'll take a chance on him here. Probably, you know, probably will sprinkle something on him by knockout. Uh, but I, I just like the kid. I, I'm going to stick with him. Yeah, I think he probably, if you like Almeida, probably take him by knockout. Yeah. I think within three rounds, like, can he win a decision against Sabatini? Maybe, but how likely is it? Like, you're right. probably going to knock him out. And uh, if you like Sabatini, I'd probably take him by decision. Because if, if he wins, he's probably getting those takedowns and uh, racking up some ground control. Um, but, yeah, I think Almeida's a fun fighter. I mean, he's a pretty long dude. Uh, he took that one left hook from Trezano in the first round, damn near got knocked out, came back, knocked him down in, th- in round two, and then knocked him out in round three. So... I, I hope we get to see him a little bit on the feet and Sabatini doesn't get him down like right away because I want to see what he can do against uh, a guy like Pat Sabatini. But for the sake of the show, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ride Almeida with you. Why not? Um, but like I said, probably uh, look for look to juice it up a little bit. I mean, I, I know he's already the underdog, but I, I mean, how does he win a decision? You know, like maybe he's right. just good at stuff in the takedowns and, and can stay at distance and maybe fight safe, doesn't want to overextend himself and uh, fights that way. But I would ex- assume he knocks him out. A lightweight bout, Manuel Torres coming in at minus 198 against Nicholas Mata coming in at plus 198. Over under one and a half rounds, plus 125 for the over, minus 125 for the under. Manuel Torres is uh four and one in his last five same with nicholas mata and uh some good hands for manuel torres i mean you're looking at the stats not a uh large sample size but says he lands 10.5 strikes per minute which is a uh, pretty damn high considering nicholas mata is sitting at 3.37 so you know he's going to come out swinging and uh it's probably going to be a stand-up battle what do you like in this one yeah, I like Torres here uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, he's a, he's slightly longer, and he fights longer, too, with the kicks and the good combinations. Like, he's super technical with the boxing. He almost reminds me of, like, a, a Baja Mendez, um, Ignacio Baja Mendez, who we saw, like, with that that kind of length, and he uses his, he uses his length well. Um, and from Nicholas Mata, I look at his record, and he's losing to Jim Miller, who's 50 years old, you know, um, Jim Miller's obviously still doing the damn thing with that big knockout in his last fight, yeah. but he got knocked out by him. He beat Joe Lowry on the contender series by decision. And then he knocks out Cameron Van Camp who had like what two fights in the UFC until they were like, yeah, no, <laughs> you're that not guy, a UFC caliber. That guy's gotta be probably the, he's like what? Six foot one, six foot two yeah. lightweight. He's gotta be like the biggest, the smallest, biggest guy I've ever seen. Yeah. Like he fights so small, but he looks so big. It's crazy. Right. So you're knocking him out, and you know you should be knocking him out. But I mean, I don't know. I, I just if this fight plays out on the feet, which you know, hundred percent should. I just think Torres's volume, um, his accuracy is just going to look better to the judges if he doesn't knock him out before that, it, before it gets to that point. Um, but yeah, overall, man, I I'm kind of a fan of Torres. I'm excited to see him again because that Frank Camacho fight, the accuracy he had to knock him out and even leading up to that kind of stunning him over and over and over um, was fun to watch, but I want to see him at a, you know, maybe a step up from Frank Camacho to see what he's got, but all the signs point to um, him beating, beating Mata in my opinion and being the better striker here. Yeah. I got to agree with you uh, because I know Mata got that knockout against Van Camp, but I just can't put much into that. Like I just really no. can't. I was watching that fight. I'm like, how is this guy six foot two and he's getting caught time after time by Nicholas Mata, who's like five foot ten, five foot nine, like somewhere around there? Not a good look, but I'm I gotta be with you here on Manuel Torres because I think the hands are a little bit sharper. He's got a little bit more power, and the activity is obviously off the charts with the hands, like with the volume and everything. Um he did pull out against Trey Ogden. Uh, was it three months ago at UFC San Antonio due to medical issues? So I don't know if that's just due to the weight cut or whatever, but hopefully he's got that figured out now. Um, but I just think, I mean, he's only, his only losses are by submission. And I don't think Nicholas Mata is going to come in here 
shooting takedowns and taking it to the yeah. ground because right. he doesn't have a submission win on his record. So Nicholas Mata has been knocked out three times before. I'm going to assume that uh, Manuel Torres can get it done in that fashion as well, considering that's how he gets it done. So I'll take uh, Manuel Torres by knockout. Bantamweight bout. Hyoni Barcelo is coming in at minus 198 against Miles John, who's coming in at plus 198. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 155 for the over, plus 155 for the under. Barcelos coming in here against uh, Johns, and Barcelos coming off the loss to Umar Namagomedov, which is uh, not a good look. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a pass. You get a good pass for that one. But 36 years old compared to 29 years old, is Hyoni Barcelos aging? What would you say? It's hard to tell. Um, you know, I first of all, that knockout he took to Umar, I I don't think he was expecting that shot at all. You know, he's probably worried about the takedowns and you know, um, Umar trying to close the distance and get in and, and get his hands locked, and then he gets caught there with a beautiful shot, which that part makes me a little bit nervous that he took a big knockout like that and he's coming back with uh, uh, that was what in January. So kind of, you know, not a quick turnaround by any means, but he was um, out. He was out. out. Yeah, I mean, his head bounced off the canvas unconscious. So and being that old, you know, it just makes you wonder. You just hope he's not losing that chin, um, especially yeah. after, you know, he's got a, a fair share of fights in the UFC at the UFC level. Uh, lost to Victor Henry and uh, Valiev, but the Valiev fight, let's see. Yeah, he had two knockdowns in that fight. I mean, he had a lot of success. Um, he's got power. What'd you say? Teamer. Yeah, yeah. he's on, on uh, tough now. On, yeah. Yeah, and fights next week, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, but Hyoni Barcelos, I just, he's probably the more well rounded fighter here, in my opinion. You know, anywhere this goes, he can get the takedowns, he'll fish for submissions. He's got great volume on the feet, does get hit a little bit if you look at his stat, stats, like, you know, history will tell you he he will get touched up at times. But the one thing I'm keying in on here is you look at Miles Johns and his record does not impress in the least bit, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, he's got the loss recently to John Castaneda um, by submission. But outside of that, man, his wins, Vince Morales cut from the UFC. Anderson Dos Santos, I, I don't believe, is in the UFC anymore. Um, same with Kevin Natividad. So, I mean, yeah. Mario Batista and John Castaneda, I believe, are the only guys left in the UFC, and both guys finished him. So, I, I mean, is he fighting to the level of fighter he is, you know, losing to the UFC caliber guys and beating the guys who aren't cut out for it? Um, so there's kind of some questions there for me. I mean, he does have some takedowns that he will land at times, but against Barcelo, or uh, Hione Barcelos, I just don't see him having a lot of success in that department. And on the feet, you know, Hyoni's pretty damn good too. So overall, I think this is Barcelo's fight to win for sure. Yeah, I uh, I agree with you. I just don't like the direction that he's heading in. You know, maybe it's it's like a bit of a bounce back for him. I mean, he's thirty six. It's like what what's uh what's like what are you fighting for at this point? Like, right? Is it just for paychecks? And you know, it's just part of part of what you do. But I mean, he's one in three in his last four. Granted, the losses are to Umar Nurmagomedov, uh, Victor Henry in that one, like Barcelos was a big favorite in that one. And that was Victor Henry's debut. Um, and then Barcelos against Team Valley of who, you know, is on tough now. So I'm looking at that, like, I don't know at the chalk. Like, I just can't really, I don't think I can get behind it. Like he had a good performance against Trevin Jones, which he was a, a favorite in that one as well. But miles John's 29 years old. And I know in his last fight was the one where he was supposed to be cornered by James Kraus and they like wouldn't let him in. Right. So he didn't have like a coach in his corner. Um, so what he's up to now is a, a question and it'll be his first, you know, fight with uh, a corner, a new corner. So who knows what, how that's going to go down. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, something about this one feels wrong. Like, to lay the chalk on Barcelos, even though like it looks like on paper he should win because he's, he's well seasoned. The losses aren't aren't terrible, but at the same time, it's like he's probably slowing down. Miles Johns might be you know hitting a stride in his career at 29 years old. 
I don't know. I, it just screams like red flags to me. I don't know. I, I just, just something about it. Something about it. Um, probably just won't even bet it. To be honest. Yeah, I, I I could see like violence in this fight. Honestly, I mean, I could see both guys coming out there swinging. Um, you know, Barcelos has the finishing ability, and obviously he's coming off the knockout. Miles John, I think, needs a big finish here. You know, so far in his in his career in the UFC, he's kind of win loss win loss. Um, and if I believe all of them besides Morales are finishes. So the guy can be finished and he can get finishes. Same with Barcelo. So I could see this one going under. I'll, I'll have to look. Uh, what did bet openly have the over under at? Do you remember? Uh, I could pull it up right here. <clears throat> two and a half. Yeah, so. two and a half minus 155 for the over plus 155 for the under. I don't really mind it. Yeah. I don't really mind the under. Yeah, I mean, considering uh, Barcelo's just got knocked out uh, by Umar, who, you know, hadn't really been knocking guys out like that. Uh, yeah. But John's, I mean, John's has a split decision win to Adrian Giannis in LFA. Hmm. So, Giannis has got them hands, too. Some, I'm telling you, something about this one doesn't smell right. Does not smell right. Go no. with your gut. Go with your gut. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if that. If, I, if I'm smelling things right, you know, but I get for the sake of the show, since it doesn't smell right, I'll take Miles Johns and uh, we will see. A welterweight bow here, Nicholas Dalby coming in at plus 175, the 38 year old years old against uh, Muslim Salikov, who's 39 years old and coming in at minus 175, over under two and a half rounds, minus 155 for the over, plus 155 for the under. Both guys, one loss within their last five fights. Uh, Salikov coming off the KO win to Andre Fialio. And um, Nicholas Dobby coming off the win to Worley Alves this January. Split decision win. Who are you liking in this one? I know Nicholas Dobby seems like he's been your boy for uh, for a while. Yeah. Um, were you on him too against Alves? Or were no, we on opposite sides? Yeah, we were on opposite sides there. Yeah. Um, you know, I just like Nicholas Dalby's ability um, to, you know, have that pace and volume for all three rounds. I mean, he's a big, strong dude. He'll push you up against the cage. He'll land the volume, um, get some control at times. Like, he can kind of do it all. He averages over a takedown per fight, uh, especially when he needs them. When he really needs the takedowns, it seems like that grappling and wrestling's there to kind of get him out or bail him out of bad situations or, or just use it to, to win rounds. Um, he does almost have a negative strike differential, but he's a tough dude. I mean, he's not out there getting dropped every fight or, or losing fights by knockout. He's really durable, and you mix that in with the cardio and pace is what I like about him, and he's able to win fights that way. But Salikov, his striking's slick, man. I mean, those spinning kicks to the body he lands, he's fast with it. Um, you know, beat Andre Fialo in his last fight, which now doesn't age, like, as well just because Fialo is just getting knocked out left and right. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to gauge where he's at, too. I mean, guys like that, strikers should be knocking out uh, Andre Fialo. So um, for that, lost by KO to Li Jingliang. Um, I don't know, man. 39 years old. That number scares me a lot. Uh, but, you know, he is 19-3 and three as a 39-year-old. That's pretty impressive in itself. You know, he, he showed that. You know, uh, maybe he was going to slow down after the Lee knockout, but then goes and gets one of uh, one uh, himself. So that was impressive, too. In this one, I, I really want to stick with Nicholas Dalby just because he doesn't really ever steer me wrong. Uh, win over Alves, Claudio Silva. You know, he's kind of been my guy, but um, man, I'm torn on this one. I, I really am. I'm going to stick with Dalby just because um, of my past history with him. This is a fight, honestly, that could go either way to me. I could see both guys having their moments on the feet, especially. I don't think we're going to see a knockout here um, unless it's Dalby doing the knockout, but he's not really that guy. I mean, he's not the guy to go out there and just find the chin and put you down. He's more of that pace and volume. Um, so, yeah, man, give me Dalby here to win a decision. I'm going to say 29-28 or split decision for him. Yeah, I see this one being pretty close too. So, I mean, considering that, I'd probably lean the dog in Dalby because the takedown ability is there. Although Salikov, you know, he's not really getting taken down at will like that. Like he's got pretty solid takedown defense and he keeps you at range with those kicks. So that could be a problem for him. 
Um, but I think the volume on the feet we saw in the last fight with Dalby, like he put it on Worley Alves, who kind of gassed out, but at the same time, it's like he, he just outlasted him uh, in that one. So, yeah, I mean, smaller cage. Uh, you know, he's coming in here. I would, I would probably just try to like push him up against the cage, control him. Just don't sit at kicking range with Mozum Zalikov. Like that's about all you got to do, and uh, probably easier said than done. But that's, right. I think that's the game plan you got to go in here with against Salikov. And if he does that, I think he's got a good chance to win. So I'm going to say dog or pass in this one. I don't know if I could, you know, take Salikov at, at minus 175 or even, you know, on most books, it's probably closer to minus 200 for Salikov at this point. Um, so I'm going to go dog or pass. I'll stick it with you with uh, Nicholas Dalby, slightly younger, one year younger. And, uh, it seems like he had that little resurgence when he came back on the London card last year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe he's, he's been reborn. So I'll take him. Uh, flyweight bout Jimmy Flick and Alessandro Costa. Minus 220 for Costa, plus 220 for Jimmy Flick. Over under two and a half rounds. Plus 180, or well, plus 190 for the over. Minus 190 for the under. Uh, Jimmy Flick. Coming in here after the loss to Charles Johnson and uh, wasn't too impressed with that performance, I got to say. But Alessandro Costa uh, made his UFC debut against Amir Albazi and gave him a decent fight considering, you know, Albazi might be fighting for a title later in the year. Well, we'll see. But, I mean, that's a tough debut uh, to, to go in there. And he, he gave him a decent fight. But minus 225 is... is Hefty, I would probably lean for a, a knockout prop because Costa has got the ability to do that. Jimmy Flick has been knocked out multiple times. And uh, if Charles Johnson can knock you out or at least ground and pound you out of there, I would assume Costa can. Um, so, yeah, that's the way I'm going to go. But the submission is there for Jimmy Flick. That's, that's obviously the MO for that guy. And I don't think Costa is going to, fall into those traps. Like, just don't go to the ground with Jimmy Flick. You should be solid. Um, but he does have submissions himself, so maybe he could, you know, try to out, out uh, BJJ Jimmy Flick and get caught. What are you thinking? Yeah, man. Um, Alessandro Costa, Costa, what a debut to be handed Amir Albazi in your UFC debut. Like, that's just uh, disrespectful by the UFC, man. How are you going to give a debut or Amir? But I know, I mean, Amir didn't really, that's his last fight before Kai, but before that, he didn't exactly have that much UFC experience at the time either. Um, but the one thing I love about Costa, especially fighting a guy like Jimmy Flick, is you look at the takedown defense, uh, 87%, and that basically comes from the Amir Abazi fight. because He's only got that in the um, fight on Dana White's contender series where these stats are coming from. Um, I mean, Amir Abazi had two knockdowns, but he only took Costa down once in the entire fight. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he showed good takedown defense for the most part. He showed that on the feet, like, he'll swing for it. He'll go for the he'll go for the chin. He's not scared to stand and bang with guys. And against Jimmy Flick, a guy who's been knocked out five times in his career and doesn't really have any knockouts himself, um, you know Flick's going to want to get it to the ground and try to, try to find the submission. Uh, Costa, use the takedown defense. Don't let it go there. Keep it on the feet. And I think you could be the sixth guy to knock out Jimmy Flick. I really do. That's where he's going to have a huge advantage in this fight is on the feet. Um, I like Flick. He, you know, he can be fun. I, I think this is going to be a fun fight. The flying triangle against Durden was super impressive, but I just don't see it happening against a guy like Alessandro Costa. I think Costa is a guy that that could get wins in the UFC, and uh, I think he gets it done here against Flick too. Yeah, I think he's he trains at uh, the gym that Alexa Grasso, Irene Aldana. And Diego Lopez train at, I believe. Yeah. Um, so bit of a, a tough L last week. So maybe he can can uh redeem the gym this week and get the win against Jimmy Flick. I'll go with uh Costa for the pick. Bantaway bout Kyung Ho Kong coming in against Christian Quinones, who sits at minus 200, and uh Kong sits at plus 200. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 160 for the over, plus 160 for the under. 5-0 in his last five for Quinones, 4-1 in his last five for Kyung Ho Kong, but he's had a number of pretty close fights. Uh, the Danabak refight was, you know, not not a, a 
dominant win by any means. Like it was a yeah. close fight, and then he had a couple splits to Brandon Davis, and uh, I'm not even gonna try to say Ping Young, Ping Young Lee, Ping Ping Yuan Lee, uh, and then the loss to Ronnie Yaya, which doesn't age too well. Um, but yeah, Christian Quinones, first fight in the UFC, gets it done against Khalid Taha in the first round knockout. I don't know how much stock you can put into that one. Khalid Taha didn't have the greatest UFC career, but what are you thinking on this one? Yeah, originally I like Quinones. Um, for, you know, just watching that Khalid Taha fight, his hands looked good. Obviously, he holds the power. He's kind of longer, 5'8", 70-inch reach um, with great volume as well. He does get touched up a little bit, at least what we've seen in his first few fights in the UFC. Um, but Kang, Kong, is it Kang or Kong? Is it Kong? I don't know. I, I don't want to be disrespectful here to the fighters, but Kyung Ho Kang. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. He will be the slightly longer fighter. Um, not as much volume as a guy like Kanones, but he does have the experience. The one thing I noticed though, watching his tape and, and film is that there's times on the feet when he's getting backed up, he looks a little bit uncomfortable. Like he's gotten out of some bad situations in the past. Um, you know, kind of using that takedown and grappling, trying to get a hold of guys, take them down and get out of some of those bad striking exchanges he's in. But the one thing that would worry me in a fight against a guy like Christian Canones, if you're Canones, is that experience for Kong. Been in there with, um, you know, I want to say Denad Botkari, but the guy just got cut. But he's a decent <laughs> striker. So, you know, yeah. he can stand in there with, with decent strikers and win the fight. Um, so yeah, man, I don't know. I, I want to see more out of Christian Canones before taking him in a fight like this. So for the pick, I'm probably going to go Canones, but uh, betting wise, I'm probably not laying anything on him here. Yeah. I'm kind of with you. It's a little chalky for him, you know, second UFC fight and, uh, Kyung Ho has been around for a while. And, but I just look at this one when like fighting styles, Canones, he, he moves around pretty well, like laterally he's in and out. And uh, I think that'll probably give Kyung Ho some, some problems on the feet. Like the movement might be tough for, for Kong to land anything considering he lands 2.99 strikes per minute. And uh Kenyon is sitting at 5.2 in his two or his one UFC fight, one Dana White competitor series fight. So Kyung might might have to go to the ground in this one. He's got averages two takedowns per 15 minutes. I think that's probably the the way he beats him. I don't think he can outpoint him uh, in a, a three-round bout. So if he wants to win, I think he's probably got to press him up against the cage or at least corner him, like make sure he's up against the cage uh, because the movement of Quinones is, is uh, going to be tough to deal with. But for the sake of the show, I'll take Quinones. Pretty chalky, though. I don't know if... Uh, as far as like a straight money line play, I, I probably would stay away. Maybe, you know, enough to throw it in a parlay uh, or something like that. Or maybe look for des by decision because Kyung Ho Kong has, has been pretty durable throughout his career. He's been uh, knocked out once in, uh, what, 27 fights. So pretty durable. Smaller cage, 15 minutes. He should probably make it to the end. Um, so I'll go with Quinones. Flyway bout. Carlos Hernandez coming in at plus 115 against Dennis Bondar, who's coming in at minus 115. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 172 and a half for the over and one plus 172 and a half for the under. Uh, Bondar, four and one in his last five. His last fight was against Malcolm Gordon, and that one he broke his arm. He had to, tried to post on a takedown and broke his arm. And then we haven't seen him since, but before that, a number of withdraws for him. Um, and he withdrew against Ode Osborne in 2021, withdrew against Victor Rodriguez 2021, uh, rescheduled bout with Malcolm Gordon, then lost, and then withdrew against Ode Osborne again. So maybe some health concerns for the guy because he's withdrawing and then he's breaking his arm in a fight. So that's not necessarily uh, you know something you want to look at that gives you confidence to bet on him. But the ground game is pretty solid. He's got a number of submissions, 11 on his record. He's never won a fight by decision, so he's kind of all action. And we're looking at this one against Carlos Hernandez, who most of the time goes to decision and has been pretty durable throughout his career. He's only been 
finished once, and that was in his last fight against Alan Nascimento. So kind of a clash of styles. What are you thinking? Yeah, um, man, watching the tape, Bondar is so fun to watch at times. I mean, he's got a pace. He's strong. You know, for, he kind of looks like a smaller guy, but he's strong, especially when he gets his hands locked. He's got good control. He can get it done on the ground. Um, I was watching one of his past fights, and I don't remember exactly which opponent it was in one of the lower level promotions, but he was a good like five inches shorter than the dude. And he goes out there, has a tough, you know, battle in the first round, and then gets the dude down, who is a good grappler himself, and, and submits him via arm triangle. And I mean, he's clearly a way smaller dude. So it was impressive to me that he was able to, you know, control him like that, find an impressive submission. Um, Hernandez just doesn't do a lot that impresses me. And, you know, we haven't really seen him, um, too much in the UFC so far against Alta Morano and he won the split decision, but again, it wasn't anything that he did that was great. Um, nothing he really did that was bad, but against a guy like Bondar, who has a lot of fun fights, who's going to come forward, um, be aggressive. He's going to be in your face the whole time. He's fast. You know, he's good strike, a good striker. And if he gets Hernandez down, I just think he's going to be stronger and that control will be a lot better. Um, I really like Bondar here. I really do. I'm not sold on Hernandez in the least bit. Um, I can't wait till the props come out because I think we do see him finish Hernandez one way or the other. So that's going to be my pick. And uh, I'll probably definitely have a bet on this one as well. Yeah, I'm going to go with him as well uh, because, I mean, he was a minus 280 favorite against Malcolm Gordon. And uh, obviously – Lost that one because he got injured. So they were pretty high on him coming into the UFC. And uh, now we're getting him against Carlos Hernandez, who, I mean, won that. I don't know. That was a close fight against Victor Altamirano. Let's just say that. I, it wasn't like one sided by the least bit right. split decision. Could have went either way. So he could be 0 and 2 in the UFC. Um, and I, I just don't think he has like that high of a, a ceiling. And Bondar definitely has like a much higher ceiling looking at this. It's been off for a while. I bet he he's probably, you know, really itching to get in there and get a win, considering he's had all those bouts rescheduled and then got injured. So, I mean, his last win was 2020 uh, in August. So that's near three years since his last win. So I'm going to guess he comes in here really wanting to get a win and really motivated to get a win. And, you know, minus 115 against Carlos Hernandez is uh it's not a bad price considering what you know hernandez has done in the ufc so i'm gonna go yeah. with bondar for the pick and uh could see it by submission the good thing about his injury too is it's not like a shoulder or a knee you know it's like a broken arm that can that can heal and you can kind of get back in there but man that was nasty against gordon yeah. um I, I was interested to see how that fight would have played out too because you got gordon who gets finished um, Bondar was, was being aggressive in there, kind of got clipped once, but, uh, but yeah, man, I'm excited to see him. Uh, I think, you know, this guy could either be a bust or he's going to make a lot of noise in the UFC, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Another flyway bout the boy Jalgas Jumagulov against Felipe Boons. I think that's how you say it. Uh, plus 155 for Felipe minus 155 for Jalgas. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 167 and a half for the over, plus 167 and a half for the under. Uh, Jalgas, one and four in his last five, coming in here as the favorite. Uh, we don't have his new haircut in there. So if you didn't notice, he uh, got his haircut like Patty Bimblet because he's had some close fights. And he wants to get a little extra juice with the judges. So split decision loss to Charles Johnson, split decision loss to Jeff Molina. And then a knockout loss to Manel Cop. His last win, Jerome Rivera in uh, 2021. That was the Poirier McGregor three card. So the last time he got a win was when Conor McGregor had uh, got his leg snapped. So it's been a while. I'm, I'm sure he's cracking at the bit to uh, get a win. But I'm looking at this one, man. Felipe Boons training with uh, the Pitbull brothers down in Brazil. It's a good camp. Um, and he put his time in over at ACA. And uh, that's obviously it's a, you know, a Kazakhstan promotion like over in uh, with those guys, with uh, those those killers over in Kazakhstan. And uh, I'm looking at this one like. Zalgashu Magulov is is from Kazakhstan and uh, he's Owen. He went uh, one and three 
in ACA. So does that mean he's losing to Zalgas because he's been losing to these Kazakhstani uh, type fighters? Or does that mean like he's had the experience and he's going to get this win because he, he's he's already seen that type of style? But his last two wins are in uh, LFA and he got a round one uh, ground and pound win in uh, the beginning of January. So I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of I would think you're pretty crazy to like lay chalk on Jogus <laughs> at this point. You know, like he's one and four in his last five. And you're gonna like chalk on him, like you gotta have some big stones. Do you got big stones or not? Oh man, I want to. I want to just because like the experience factor and who he's been fighting, but like he's not beating any of those guys. So <laughs> it's like I don't know. Maybe this is a pretty even fight. It's really hard to tell um, because Zalgas has fought, and you know Amir Albazi uh, with the loss there. Um, Manel Cop, Jeff Molina, Charles Johnson. So he's not fighting bums by any means, and he's getting some split decisions against Molina and Charles Johnson. Um, so the strikers, you know, he's kind of going toe to toe with. He's not really getting knocked out besides the Manel Cop fight. Everybody else, he's landing nearly the same amount of strikes as the other ones. You know, Charles Johnson landed 115, while Zalgus landed 119. So in this fight, if he can just keep it on the feet, you know, Felipe. Boones has, let's see, one, two, eight submissions on his record. Um, so he's good on the ground. He Offensively, at least, he's been submitted a couple of times. Zalgas has good takedown defense. He's got good offensive wrestling, too. Um, in his striking, you know, he kind of he kind of runs a pace. Um, he does get hit a little bit, but I, it's just hard to tell if he's going to have to worry about that with Felipe here or not. If it does play out on the feet, I think Zalgas can, can get another win here by decision. If it hits the ground, I think he might be a tad outclassed with the grappling, but, um, getting Zalgas to the ground is, is, you know, kind of a task itself. He's got a low base. He's strong and, uh, he's kind of wiry, man. He's just all over the place. So, um, for the pick, I'll take Zalgas, but nothing betting wise on him right here. Yeah. I, I just look at the frames of them are a bit different too. Like Boone's is pretty long and lengthy, five foot seven, 71 inch reach compared to Jalgas, who's sitting at five foot four, 66 and a half injuries. So if it's on the feet. Uh, Jalgas better be getting in, inside. Um, but the activity on the feet has, has always been good with Jalgas. And uh, he's he's a tough dude. I mean, he'll fight to the bell for sure. Um, but it's just, I don't think I could lay chalk on him, considering one and four in his last five. And, and uh, I don't even care who he's been losing to. Like, I mean, right. the loss to Charles Johnson doesn't really age the best either. Like, he hasn't looked that good as of recently, so. Yeah, no, agreed. Yeah, uh, I would probably lean dogger pass. You know, flyweights too. Some uh, room for variability, like we saw last week with Steve Urseg making his debut. You never know. Um, so I'm going to go with Felipe Boons for the sake of the show, and I'll definitely keep an eye on him as the week goes on. Flyway bout here in the women's division. Teresa Bleda coming in at minus 215 against Gabriela Fernandez coming in at plus 215. Over under two and a half rounds. Minus 160 for the over, plus 160 for the under. Four and one in their last five for both ladies. Uh, the loss to Jasmine Jazdavicius for Gabriela Fernandez in her debut ages pretty well. I'm not going to lie. Um, but and so does Teresa Blada's loss in her debut to Natalia Silva. So both ladies facing some really tough competition in their debuts. Um, but the matchup doesn't look good for Gabriela Fernandez as far as that's why I like the line is the way it is. Cause I think on the feet, Fernandez probably going to have uh, the advantage there, but the takedowns, like we just saw what Jasmine did to her in three rounds uh, was it 11 or 12 minutes of ground control time? Something like bad. That. Yeah, yeah, something crazy. She just could not get up from her back. And then Teresa Blada is uh she's got a, a number of of minutes of ground control time. I mean, she had five minutes of ground control time against Natalia Silva, who's like pretty solid on the ground. And then uh, what 11 minutes of ground control time on her contender series fight. So the takedowns are definitely going to be there for her. And if she gets those, she probably cruises to a win. Um, but if she doesn't, Fernandez pretty probably pretty live. I mean, 
women's MMA. We just saw it this week. <laughs> like, yeah. so we just saw Jasmine come in as a plus 270 underdog in cash. Um, I don't really like banking on women's takedowns. And in this spot, you know, I think Blada should go in there and, and win. But I don't like banking on that. I just, we've seen it time and time again. Like, I just can't really get behind the big women's chalk all the time. Burned me last week with Miranda Maverick, even though it didn't really burn me that bad. But yeah, Blaza probably wins, but I'm not, probably not touching it. What do you think? Yeah, I think she probably wins as well. Um, but man, just can't get caught. We saw her get caught once, but I think Silva and Fernandez are, you know, a, a <laughs> mile apart. In, in skill level um but yeah, yeah for fernandez too that lost to jazz davicius just ages phenomenally because jasmine jazz davicius in her last fight last weekend looked phenomenal and looked like she could make some noise in that division for sure beating miranda maverick like that who is young up and coming has some good wins on a record who's tough to beat and she dominated her as a big underdog so um yeah nothing to hang your head about with that loss I just think Blada, though, she knows the blueprint to beat Gabriela Fernandez. She she saw it with with um, um, Jasmine Jazz Davicius here. So if she gets her on the ground, I, I think she's going to control her, possibly find a submission, uh, land in some ground and pound. I mean, she's got finishes on top of girls like that, landing ground and pound. She's got finishes by submission from the top. So if it goes to the ground, um, I think it could be a quick night for Fernandez. But if it stays on the feet, it obviously gets really interesting. I honestly at plus money kind of have, have flirted with the idea of taking the under two and a half here. We've seen both girls in action before. I mean, Blada coming off of a knockout loss, but also has a decent amount of finishes on her record too. Um, Fernandez doesn't have as many finishes. Um, she does have a couple of submissions and knockout. Um, so yeah, man, I don't know. For some reason, I, something's telling me that Blade is just going to take her down, find that sub and make it look pretty easy. Um, and if, if that happens, man, that plus money under two and a half looks pretty damn good. Yeah, I will say for Blada, I mean, she's 21 years old. And if you look at her amateur results, she had a win when she was 18 years old to the girl Lucy Pudilova in, uh, <laughs> in an exhibition bout in the, in the amateurs. That was back in 2020. Um, and then, I mean, she's been fighting since she's like 15. So I mean, she's been around. She's young. She's probably getting better every day, and uh, she's been around for since she's 15. So, I mean, probably a pretty bright future for her. Um, but at the same time, it's like Natalia Silva was doing some bad things to her on the feet, and, yeah. and Fernandez could could definitely expose her on the feet there too. But for the sake of the show, I'll take Blada because she, if she gets the takedowns, it's not looking good. Uh, Banton White bout here. Dan Argetta coming in at plus 175 against Ronnie Lawrence, minus 175 for Lawrence. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 220 for the over, plus 220 for the under. Both guys, four and one in their last five. Dan Argetta uh, got the win in his last time out against Nick Ag Aguirre, and I believe that was a short notice fight for Aguirre. Uh, his debut against Damon Jackson, I think he took that one on short notice against Damon Jackson. And and uh, made it to a decision, but ultimately lost. He was on the, the Ultimate Fighter season uh, 29 with Volkanovski and uh, Ortega. And uh, he's coming in here against Ronnie Lawrence, who I can't get a read on because the man got so many takedowns in his first uh, three appearances within the UFC. Uh, one of them was on the Contender Series, but he got 12 takedowns on the Contender Series against Jose Johnson. And then eight takedowns in his debut against Vince Cachero. Six takedowns in his next fight against Manny Martinez. And then he gets taken down ten times by Saeed Yukab Kakramanov. And then Kakramanov gets cut. So I don't even know what, what, what does that even mean. Like, I don't even, Kakramanov, I don't, he should be in the UFC. Like, that guy is, is really good. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, all right, well, your wrestling is good, Ronnie. But how good is it? Because you just got smoked by a, another wrestler. And Argetta has uh, some solid wrestling. And we just saw it in his last fight, four takedowns, 10 minutes of ground control time. So I'm looking at this one, like, plus money on, on Dan Argetta against Ronnie Lawrence, who just got out-wrestled in his last fight. Maybe not looking too bad. What are you thinking? 
Yeah, I'm kind of the same way, and I've kind of gone back and forth. Like, this should be a really fun fight if if you're into wrestling and grappling. Like, this is going to be high-paced guys that are looking to get the fight to the ground. I love watching Ronnie Lawrence fight um, in some of his fights because that pace he puts on guys with the wrestling is just relentless, man, just over and over and over, and seems like he's got the gas tank to hold up. And also has some hands, too. I mean, we've seen him land the knockouts. Um, the guy's pretty well-rounded, in my opinion. Uh, but I was talking to you. I don't know if he's got like a legit wrestling background or if he just kind of picked it up when he got into mixed martial arts, but he's pretty damn good. But the thing that worries me is you see him go up against the actual wrestler in Saeed Jacob and he just gets dominated. Um, you know, taken down 10 times in that fight is insane. But it's almost like the same story with Dan Argueta because he does have a wrestling background and he showed it in his last fight getting four takedowns, but he goes up against Damon Jackson and he gets controlled for the first two rounds um, and, and really couldn't do anything. I know Damon Jackson's a good grappler, but um, you would think hit Dan's pedigree of wrestling in his background would have at least had him be able to get out of some of those positions and uh, get the fight where he wanted it to. But UFC debut, sometimes, you know, the nerves, the jitters, you're not exactly um you know fighting your like like your normal self so this is going to be interesting though if ronnie lawrence isn't this phenomenal wrestler that you know he's shown in some fights i think dan is gonna is gonna be able to get the fight where he wants it and steal rounds based off control and, and landing maybe the bigger shots but if ronnie puts everything together with the pace and uh you know the solid striking landing good combinations good volume um as the fight goes on, I could see Dan Argueta kind of gassing out a little bit. He holds a lot of muscle, and there's a lot of muscle on that dude. He's jacked, and uh, he does kind of slow down as the fights go on. Um, his, his arms look a little heavier. His shots aren't as powerful as they were in the beginning of the fight. So um, I could see this fight being like another split decision fight. Both guys have similar skill sets. Both guys um, are going to have the you know similar game plan. And it's just going to be who can implement it better. And right now, it's kind of hard to tell which guy's going to be able to do that. Give me, oh man, give me Argueta. I'm going to take Argueta for the pick, um, just because that, I think that wrestling background will take him a little bit further here. Yeah, I I think this one should be a little bit closer as far as the line goes, um, because he was a plus. Argueta was a plus five hundred underdog to Dam Damon Jackson. Ended up losing that fight 29-28. He got controlled for most of the first two rounds against Damon Jackson. A lot of it was uh, like he was on his – or Jam Damon Jackson had his back, and he was just kind of like defending chokes, hitting him with those little short shots to the back of the head. And then the third round, uh, he he had a little spurt at the end and, and took the, the third round. But that was coming off of uh, a month before that. He had a five-round – uh, title fight in LFA, which he won by split decision. So, I mean, I would assume he took that fight. Like he just had to get in the UFC. It was short notice against a guy that, yeah. you know, needed a fight. So, I mean, he put on a good showing too. Like he was undefeated at that point. His only, he had an exhibition loss to Tercios in the tough house, but that's his only loss like on his career or on his record. So I, I, I put this, Fight like a little bit closer to like plus one thirty for Argetta, maybe minus one thirty for uh, Ronnie Lawrence. So I think there's probably more value on the dog. Um, but like you said, it's, I think it's probably could be like a split decision fight. It probably goes the distance. Uh, neither guy has like big submission skills. Neither guy has big knockout power. Both guys are pretty durable. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe take one of them by decision if you like them. A little sweeten it up or uh, just just play the dog. I think it's probably dog or pass to me. You know, after seeing what Ronnie Lawrence got done to him by Saeed Yacob, I can't back him at chalk in his yeah. next fight. So I'll take Argetta for the sake of the show, and uh, we'll, ride, we'll ride with him. The uh, first fight of the night, light heavyweight bout, Zach Pauga coming in at plus 180 against Modestus Bukaskis coming in at minus 180. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 160 for the over, plus 160 for the under. Zach Pauga, four and one in his last five, and his only loss is to the man, Mohamed Usman, but he's coming down to light heavyweight. His uh, second fight at light heavyweight, Bukaskis, second stint in the UFC, 
came back on somewhat short notice to Tyson Pedro. Got a big dub as a, an underdog in that one in uh, Perth, Australia, UFC 284. Now he's coming in here against Zach Pauga, uh, coming to Las Vegas in this one. And uh, he is a favorite. And what are you thinking? Yeah, man. Um, Bukaskis is hot right now. I mean, he, he gets yes. he gets kicked from the UFC, gets two fight or uh, two wins in Cage Warriors, and then comes back and beats Tyson Pedro, parlay buster of the card at Perth. I mean, everybody was on Pedro, yeah. hometown guy, um, you know, from Australia. Everybody wanted him to win. Everybody thought he was going to win, and he was just kind of outclassed. I mean, it looked like he was hurt. He was slow, couldn't land anything, was hesitant to engage. And Bacoscus was just aggressive and, and did his thing that whole fight. Um, Bacoscus is strong, too. You look at him, man. He might be on the juice. I was telling you earlier, I think he's probably juicing. That dude's big. He's strong. Um, but in this fight against uh, – he, he's shown, I guess before I get into to Pauga, Bacoscus has been knocked out, um, especially in his first UFC stint. So you look at Pauga, who showed some great striking on the ultimate fighter, um, even showed some good slick striking and accuracy against Usman until he got caught with that left and just put out cold. Um, and then in, in the fight against Jordan Wright, I think everybody in the world had under one and a half, and it was just a boring up against the cage, not much going on at all. Or they had Pauga by knockout because Jordan Wright had been either knocking people out or getting flatlined. So um, this one, though, it, it makes me want to take the dog just knowing that Pauga does have good striking. And Bacoscus has been knocked out. But I just keep going back to that momentum that Bacoscus has. It's like he's got something to prove now. He was let go from the UFC once. He's back in now. He just made the most of it against Tyson Pedro. And uh, Palga, man, you know, decent fight against Wright, I guess. Um, but he's going to need a win, too. So it's kind of hard to just gauge where this fight's going to go. It stays on the feet, though. Um, both guys can crack. So it should be really, really interesting. For the pick, give me Bacoscus. I can't I can't bet against the momentum like that and a guy who just desperately needs to keep winning if he wants to keep his job. Did I just hear you say both guys can crack? Oh, oh yeah. I mean Zach Powell got one KO on his record. Yeah, maybe not the power, but like we've seen like the striking's at least slick for a big dude. Like he's yeah, fast, he's fast and he's, fast. Uh, he's technical. Like Maybe showboats a little bit sometimes with his hands down, which might bite him in the ass. But um, you know he's technical. He at least is is a good technical striker. I think the only way Zach Paga wins this fight is if he does what he did to Jordan Wright. Makes it look yeah. Just make it boring as hell. Throw him up against the cage. Use your strength and keep him there. Press your head up up against his chin. Land some knees. Land some elbows. Uh, but he can't sit at range with Modestus Bukowski's. He just can't. Like, yeah, Bukowski's six foot three, lengthy, uh, fast too. Um, and it's got good kicks. Pauga, I don't think, has nearly the the type of kick game that that Bukowski's does. And uh, I don't give him like that. Like, that's the only way I see him winning is like throw him against the cage for you know two at least two rounds out of three, or at least take him to the ground and hold him there. Um, but the one thing is, is uh, the PTSD for Bukowskis. Last time he was he was in the apex, the apex was when he got his knee obliterated by Clear Roundtree. So, you know, maybe you could look at that like it's, uh, you know, PTSD, or you could look at it like he wants to get it back, or he's more motivated right. to get a win there. And I actually am going to go with him being more motivated to get a win there because that's like probably it. you know something that you're going back to and you're like, all right, I'm not letting this happen again. You know, if he made it back in the UFC, gets a win back in the UFC, and against a, a pretty solid opponent, even though Tyson Pedro was, you know, somewhat injured or or ill or something, that he came out after that and said he wasn't his his full self there. But I also look at the the competition, um, for Bokaskis, like when he was in the UFC, lost to Jimmy Crew, who's not terrible, um, Ola Shechek by split, who's not terrible, and Clay Roundtree, who's who had like a great resurgence to his career with that that uh, performance. So, yeah, I'm gonna go with Bukowskis. I don't love the price because of that factor that Pauga could just make it super boring and uh, and get the win that way. But at the same time, I think Bukowskis has more ways to win, 
and uh, is the rightful favorite in my eyes. So I'll take him. And that is all the fights. We got 14, went through 14. Dang, got through that pretty fast. Um, but those are the picks. Obviously, those aren't final. This is recorded on Tuesday. Um, and by the end of the week, we'll have our full bets available, which aren't always, you know, as our picks. And they're usually a lot of props and a lot of over under stuff like that. So stuff that you'll definitely want to get into and you can get those in uh, the double egg premium, which the link will be in the description for those. Uh, make sure you get in there. Uh, if you just, if you just want the monthly pass, it's less than a dollar a day, or you can wait till Friday night when the instant download is available. So make sure you stay tuned for that. You can follow on uh, Instagram to stay up to date at the double egg and uh, stay up to date there and get everything you need to know about that. At HJ Picks on the, the medias for me. Where can they find you? TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram at the Parlay MMA. All right, thank you guys for watching. Drop a subscription down to support the channel. Drop a like if you enjoyed the video. Till next time, Double Egg signing out.